last night I journeyed backwards in time to the medieval world of Dark Tower. In this amazing game, I had to find three keys, lay siege to the tower, and defeat the enemy within. Each move was a challenge. The computer kept track, giving me secret information, pictures, sounds, surprises. Then, ahead of my opponent, I made my move. The battle was joined, and I was victorious. Dark Tower. I remember being very lucky to get this game for Christmas as a kid. We played the heck out of it, and it was, and still is, a lot of fun. So much so that I collected and restored my broken game and made a tower to hold my iPhone so it lives once again, as you can see here. So, fast forward 40 years and Restoration Games has stepped up and fulfilled that nostalgia desire to play this again. And now, in return to Dark Tower, the game is far more nuanced and challenging than the original ever was. But how good is it really? Well, we'll find out coming right up on RPG Retro Reviews. The Dark Tower awaits once again. Hello everyone, I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week, I'm reviewing a newer board game, but its connections go back 40 years and it does have tenuous connections to old school fantasy role playing games, so let's just go ahead and dive right in. Back in 1981, Milton Bradley released the Dark Tower electronic board game. Clearly with the Dungeons and Dragons fad in full gear and fantasy fiction both in books and movies soaring in popularity, Milton Bradley wished to cash in on what was happening, and to their credit, they spent millions of dollars in research and development bringing their game to market, and in the end, what resulted was one of the most innovative board games of the decade, a true integration of board game mechanics and interactive electronic computerized components, the Dark Tower game was a lot of fun. They even got Orson Welles to promote it in their commercial. So, Milton Bradley's commitment to their product was admirable. The high production values and the electronic motorized tower wasn't cheap either, and the game retailed for $70. Quite the price tag in 1981. And I was fortunate enough to get one of these for Christmas, and we played the heck out of it to be sure. I was full into my own love for Dungeons and Dragons at this point, and we usually ended up playing Dark Tower whenever we couldn't get the regular group together for D&D, or we just wanted to play something different and give the Dungeon Master a break. The gameplay was relatively simple and had some complex elements. The tower itself could tell you the result of your moves, adjudicate the combat between your valiant warriors and the vile brigands, and keep track of what inventory you had. Though it wouldn't tell you outright, you had to keep track of your stuff on the inventory card, and if you lost track, you'd have to spend a turn getting the tower to run down what you had, which might cost you time in regards to the other players who were in competition with you to complete the same quest. The idea was to traverse your three opposing kingdoms, seeking keys to the dark tower, one gold, one silver, and one brass, one in each kingdom. Once you did that, you returned to your home kingdom, replenished your supplies at your home citadel, figure out the riddle of the keys, storm the tower, fight the brigands within, and retrieve the magical scepter in order to defeat an evil tyrant and achieve victory. Along the way, you might get lost, encounter a plague, or even a vile dragon which would kidnap some of your warriors and take your gold. Unless you had the magical dragon sword, of course, in which case you could slay the dragon and recover all the lost warriors and gold he'd accumulated during the game. In multiplayer mode, you might encounter a mysterious wizard that would let you curse another player and let you steal some of his warriors and gold. In addition, as you traveled through the four kingdoms, you could explore dusty tombs and ruins. 
If you needed help, you could visit a sanctuary where you could replenish your lost warriors and food, and the bazaar where you could buy more warriors and food. If you didn't replenish your food, your warriors would begin to starve to death. You could almost... You could also purchase a beast to carry your gold, a scout to keep from getting lost, and a healer to help with the plague. The game was magical. I only reiterate all of this so that perhaps if you've never played the old game, you might understand the nostalgic love for it. It did have its issues, of course. The combats were rather simplistic, and the tower, though durable, would eventually give up the ghost, and once the tower was broken, the game was useless. For those of you with an inoperable tower, you might be happy to know that you can get apps on your phone that very dutifully simulate the old dark tower extremely well, which is why a few years ago I built my own dark tower to replace my broken one and put my phone in it. As you might imagine, eBay prices for a working game these days are outrageous. Sadly, Milton Bradley was sued for intellectual property theft in regards to this game and lost. Thus, production of the game was ceased and the game fell into obscurity, living on only in the minds of us many players who loved it. Fast forward 40 years to 2021 and Restoration Games released Return to Dark Tower after a very successful Kickstarter. Development took a full year, but once completed, the resulting game was a... Wonderful homage to the original, though gameplay bears only a passing resemblance to its 1981 counterpart, and that's actually a good thing. This is a much more complex game, with many components and gameplay options that far surpass the basic and somewhat repetitive play of the original game. It's not my intention to go over every detail of the new game, but I am going to go into some depth here, so you'll be able to get a pretty good handle on the gameplay and the many options available. This is what the game looks like set up on my table. It's pretty intimidating, but the gameplay itself is actually quite simple once you get the hang of it, and it offers many options for extensive replayability. As you can see from the inventory sheet in the rulebook, there are a lot of components to the game, but not all of them are used in every scenario, which you'll choose during game setup. I should mention that this is an app-driven game, which might bother some people, but Restoration Games has completed a second successful Kickstarter in 2023, so it seems like it's going to be around a lot longer than the original game was, though it's not cheap either. Currently, it's $190 from the Restoration Games website. Secondary market prices are much more expensive, so you'll have to ask yourself if it's worth it. I got mine during the Kickstarter, so I got a pretty good discount. My friends, this game is a total blast, and so I'm going to say yes, it's worth the price right up front. But let's go over the gameplay options in detail, shall we? The first thing to do is to decide what scenario you want to play. That will determine what additional components you will need, and every scenario follows the same basic setup. Put out the game board, the tower prominently in the center. It takes three AA batteries. You'll need either your phone or a tablet. I prefer to use my iPad, but you can use your phone if you like. There are 16 buildings, four of each type. The citadel, the village, the sanctuary, and the bazaar. There's a spot for one of each in each kingdom. You'll need the warrior and spirit tokens set into a pile for the players to get to. So I recommend you have a small condiment bowl, or if you like, you can pick up these handy-dandy game trays from Amazon. They also double as storage trays with lids, which is quite useful if you want to pick these up. I'll put an affiliate link in the description, and you can help the channel out by following them to make your purchase. Next, you'll need to sort and put out the 18 gear cards into six piles. There are three of each type of gear, which you can see here. Next, shuffle the treasure cards and turn three face up to create the market. You'll be able to acquire these when you visit the bazaar on the board, and I'll explain that later. Next are the potion cards. You'll acquire potions during gameplay as you fight monsters and explore dungeons. Next, you'll shuffle the corruption cards. Players may acquire corruption during gameplay when they are unable to fulfill certain tasks, lose at combat, or other things, depending on the scenario you play. And finally, there are the companion cards, quest markets, and the haggle die. Next, it's time to choose one of the four hero cards. 
Each hero has a variety of abilities and powers called virtues. You start the game with three of the virtues locked, and those can be unlocked during the game. Pick the corresponding miniature and put them on the citadel space for your corresponding kingdom. Place the appropriate kingdom virtue tile on your hero board as well. Each hero's card tells the player what resources they start with. In the case of the Orphan Skyon, it's seven warriors and one spirit token. One player is chosen to go first. Next is time to set up the app. Here's where there's a lot of customization options. From the opening screen, you'll click start a new game and sync with the tower. Once the tower is synced, you choose either a cooperative or competitive game. For this example, we'll choose competitive. And if you have an expansion, you could choose at this point. Otherwise, just pick continue, pick the number of players, and yes, you can play a solo game. Now you can choose your main objective. As you can see here, there's quite a few different scenarios to choose from, but we'll go ahead and select the recommended first game, Recover as Ghoul's Treasures. Next, you choose your adversary, and as before, there's quite a few of those to choose from as well. In this case, we'll choose Ash Strider, who has the ability to set the rivers separating the four kingdoms on fire. Next, you'll get to choose three other foes to face during the game. Each has different abilities that spawn during combats and a level. The level indicates the number of combat cards you'll have to face in order to defeat the foe. Level 2 foes have 2 cards, level 3 foes have 3 cards, level 4 foes have 4 cards, and so on. The adversary has 5 cards. Each level has 4 different foes to choose from. For example, level 2 foes are either brigands, oryx, shadow wolves, or spine fiends. Here I'll just go ahead and be traditional and go with the brigands. For our level 3 foe, we'll choose the Widowmaker Spider, and for level 4, we'll choose the Dragon. The next screen is a summary of your choices. If you're satisfied, just tap continue. Next is some game setup operations for the scenario. We have to put two skulls on each citadel and bazaar. For this scenario, we'll need the River of Fire tokens. Player 1 gains Zaida, a companion, which you can see here gives the player three wild advantages when you sacrifice an item. Very handy. I'll explain how advantages work in just a moment. And next, the app directs you to place a few of the foe tokens at various spots on the map to begin. During setup, I like to get out the corresponding foe cards and place their tokens on the cards for ease of accessibility. At this point, you're ready to begin play. This may sound like a lot, and it is, but once you've got a game or two under your belt, it goes by very quickly. The game itself is divided into months. You have six months to complete your tasks and face the adversary or the Dark Tower wins. The first month equals one player turn, and after that you'll get six to seven turns per month to accomplish the various tasks required by the scenario you're playing. The player hero cards define exactly what you can do each player turn. The turn is divided into three phases, the start of the turn, the middle of the turn, and then the end of the turn. At the start of the turn, you take your banner action, which for the Orphan Skyon is to gain one spirit token. Each companion has a different banner action. For example, the Brutal Warlord gains five warriors at the beginning of his turn. The other two heroes are the Relic Hunter and the Spy Master. Next, you'll move to the middle of the turn where you can move, take a heroic action, and then a reinforce action if you are on a space with a building. These actions can be taken in any order, and your move can be divided up as well. For example, the Orphan's Guyon can move up to three territories per turn. You could move one space to an adjacent territory, take the battle action, then move two more spaces to a bazaar and take a reinforce action. Nothing impedes movement. The cleanse action allows you to remove any skulls on buildings in the territory you are currently in, the battle action lets you fight any foes in the territory you're in, and the quest action allows you to complete a quest objective or explore a dungeon. When taking a battle action, if there are more than one foe in the territory you're in, you can choose which one you want to face. During a battle, you'll need to expend resources and advantages as set forth by the battle cards displayed on the screen. Failure to meet the requirements of a battle card means you gain a corruption. 
For example, if you are supposed to lose seven warriors and you only have three warriors left, you not only lose your remaining warriors, but also gain a corruption. I'll talk about battles in a bit more detail in just a moment. I should also mention the longer you leave foes on the board, the more threatening and difficult to kill they become, as you can see here by this threat level chart. The tower chooses when this happens, usually between turns after you drop a skull into the tower. In the game, there are three different types of quests. There is the main goal quest, and a marker is placed in the territory where the main goal needs to be completed after the first month turn is over. During play, between player turns, the app might spawn an adversary quest, and these are essentially the adversary's minions attempting to do something, and the hero needs to take certain actions to prevent it, and then move to the marked territory to complete the quest. Failure to complete the adversary quest usually results in something happening that's bad that makes accomplishing the main goal even harder than it already is. And finally, there is the companion quest. These are generally optional, but if you do manage to complete it, you gain a companion that might help you along the way. As you can see, there are quite a few companions available. The app determines who is available, and each one has different powers and abilities that can assist you. For example, a player who has Vasa, the Divine, as a companion, and who has gained corruptions might be able to have them cleansed between turns during an event that the app spawns. Exploring dungeons is fun, and as you can see here, you explore various rooms, and the app tells you what happens. You can find an item, fight foes, and more. While exploring, you might have to spend advantages, lose warrior, spend a spirit token, lose an item, find an item, and more. Just like in a battle, you also gain corruptions if you lack the resources to complete the tasks and encounters in the dungeon. After you complete your heroic action, you gain two spirit tokens. These are spent in various ways, but primarily are used during the reinforce action. Finally, if you are in a territory with a building, a citadel, sanctuary, village, or bazaar, you can take the listed action. For example, if you're at a citadel, you can either gain one potion for free or expend five spirit tokens to unlock one of your virtues. If you're at a sanctuary, you can gain one spirit token for free or spend five spirit tokens and remove all your corruptions. You can only do one or the other, not both. Corruptions are represented with corruption cards and are bad for several reasons. First, each card impedes you in some way. For example, the weak corruption means you cannot carry more than two treasures, or the cruel corruption means you lose one spirit if you reinforce at a village. If you ever have two corruptions and you have to gain a third, the game is over and everyone loses. So let me take a moment to explain glyphs. There are five different types of glyphs each representing one of the actions you can take during your turn. Between player turns, you might be directed to remove one of the seals on the tower and expose a glyph. If the glyph is facing you, whenever you have to take the glyphed action, you must spend a spirit token or you can't take that action. For example, if you have a skull or a banner glyph facing you, you have to spend a spirit token to use those action. The five glyphs are banner, cleanse, battle, quest, and reinforce. Once you have completed your turn, take a skull token from the pile and drop it in the tower. The app will react, acknowledging the end of your turn, and this might also spawn an event. An adversary might set the rivers on fire. More foes might spawn. Skulls might spit out of the tower, and if that happens, you have to place them on one of the four buildings in the kingdom the skull emerged from, and more. The skulls represent the corruption in the kingdom. The max corruption any building can have is three. If you are ever forced to place a fourth skull on a building, it is destroyed. Remove the building and the four skulls from the game entirely. Thus, the importance of taking the cleanse action when you can is quite apparent. And also, if you go to end your turn and there are no more skulls in the skull pile to put in the tower, once again, everyone loses and the game is over. So let me go into a bit more detail about battles and advantages. Before battle begins, you must calculate your automatic advantages that apply to the foe you're facing. There are six different traits, and each foe has two of them. The traits are Beast, Humanoid, Magic, 
melee, stealth, and undead. The six advantages are beast, humanoid, magic, melee, stealth, undead, and wild. Wild advantages can be used in place of the other six, thus very handy. In addition, advantages can be either automatic with a black background or conditional with a gray background on the cards. Advantages can come from your virtues, a companion, an item, or a treasure. For example, the Zayeda companion gives you plus three wild advantages if you spend one treasure. In other words, return a treasure in your inventory to the bottom of the treasure pile. That's in gray and it's conditional. If you don't have a treasure to spend, you can't gain those advantages. The Companion of the West has the Virtue, plus two wild advantages if you're in a territory with a forest. Thus, if your battle is taking place in a territory with the forest icon, you automatically get two wild advantages. If you look at the Frost Troll card, you can see that you can use either a melee or humanoid advantage against that foe, or of course a wild advantage. So before the battle begins, you'll look over your items, your treasures, your potions, your companions, and your virtues and see how many automatic advantages will apply and calculate that number. Let's say you have four, two wild advantages because the battle is taking place in a forest, one melee advantage because you have the sword item, and plus one advantage because you have a circlet of conviction giving you four to start with. Note, during combat, you could gain an additional plus three wild advantages due to your companion Zaeda, but to gain those, you'll have to spend a treasure. Note that if you were to spend the circlet of conviction treasure during a battle, you wouldn't lose the automatic advantage you gained at the beginning of the battle. You just wouldn't have it in the future. During combat, as you go through the battle cards, you tap the arrow portion of the card for each advantage you wish to spend, and this will reduce what resources you lose during combat, and you can even gain resources as well, like finding a potion. If that potion were to have an advantage you can use, you could spend it right away if you like. The app keeps track of the advantages you spent during the battle. The max number of advantages you can spend during a battle is 10, but most of the time you won't have that many. This is one of the areas of the game I find a bit clumsy and nebulous. While the app does keep track of what you've spent, it doesn't keep track of what you started with. And as you go through the cards, and some of the tougher adversaries have many cards to face, for example, you're adding more advantages from items like potions and companions along the way. It can get a bit confusing. For this reason, I like to use a 10-sided die as a record-keeping tool to keep track of my automatic and conditional advantages. If during the battle I add a conditional advantage, I just raise the total of the die. If ever the spent number in the app and the die total match, I know I'm out of advantages. The other clumsy part of the game is dividing up movement. As I mentioned before, you can divide up your middle turn actions however you want, moving a few territories, taking an action, and then moving again. You can even use a spirit token to double your move. While you start with a move of three, some items like trusted maps can add to your movement as well. And the spy master starts with four movement. And with trusted maps, they would have five. So after exploring a dungeon or fighting a battle, you might lose track of how much you've already moved. For this reason, I take a cue from Battletech and place a movement die next to my token, marking how many spaces I've already moved. So after an action is completed, I know where I left off. One thing I haven't yet discussed is the haggle die. Before you take your reinforced action, you can roll the haggle die and possibly gain some additional effect for your reinforce action. Gain three warriors, a potion, a gear, or nothing happens, or your reinforce action is canceled. While this is an interesting mechanic, our experience during play was that we forgot that the die was even there or in desperate need of taking the reinforce action and so wouldn't risk it. With all these components, you might be asking about storage and the design of the box and its plastic interior provides a place for everything. I did have to get some tiny plastic Ziploc bags for some components, but I had those just lying around. And as you can see here, everything just stacks neatly back into the box. There's even an instruction guide provided explaining where everything is supposed to go. There is a lot going on here, much more than there was in the original Dark Tower game, and this additional complexity really does add to its replayability. 
So with all of that said, let's go ahead and take a look at Return to Dark Tower on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. First of all, this thing exudes style. Every component is of the highest quality, though I have to say that we found ourselves quickly running out of warrior tokens, and given the cost of the game, I can't see how including some additional bits of cardboard would be that much more expensive. Let me commend Restoration Games for doing a great job of supplying not only a great storage box for all the components, but also an instruction sheet on how things are supposed to go back in. There's no need to get some aftermarket storage solution. It came in the box. Everything looks and works great. Many games later, years later, and my Dark Tower works as good as the day I got it. We love this game. I'm going to rate it a natural 20 critical hit. As for presentation goes, another winner. The instruction booklet is well written with pictures that are easy to follow. The gameplay as well is also fast, and once you understand the turn sequence, it flows fast from player to player. It can take a few games to get the hang of how all these things work together, and the most complex aspect of the thing is remembering all the things you can do during your turn and then implementing them effectively. This was an issue with us as well, and certain plans might take several turns to come to fruition, and I might suggest maybe having some note paper for that purpose, so if you're getting older like me, you don't lose track of what you're planning. Overall, though, the game is a total blast. The integration of the tower and the app is brilliant. At the end of the turn, we're all on the edge of our seats wondering what new event the tower was going to throw at us. And I'll rate this a 19. As for value, it's a bit up in the air for me on how to rate this. There are a lot of components, and clearly the mechanics of the tower are not cheap. This is an expensive game to purchase at $190, but I'll say this. If you enjoy quest-oriented fantasy board games, you're really going to love this game. It's a true classic and will offer you years of fun with friends and family. And for that reason, I'll rate it an 18. And that brings my overall rating for Return to the Dark Tower a 57. Amazing. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this review useful and interesting. I'd like to take a moment to thank my patrons for their support. Because without them, this channel is just not possible. Next week, we'll have some fun taking a look at early TSR Dungeons & Dragons accessories. And after that, I've got another DM's Foundry for you. How to run a city campaign. Please help me out with a like, comment, and share. Subscribe and click the little bell so you'll get notifications when I upload new content. Please check out my Teespring store, Ye Old School Shop, for some fun gaming swag, t-shirts, carry bags, coffee mugs, and more. Consider supporting me on Patreon as well. If you feel inclined to send a tip, you can do so through my PayPal tip jar or super thanks right here. A link for everything is in the description. And as always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.